Hi everybody, this is uh, week four in our lectures. This is act one in All My Sons Continued. Uh, the last part we are introduced to the setting of the play uh, to uh, Joe and uh, Chris and uh, Kate and the neighbors characters. Uh, we continue the same part. This is the house of the Kellers, which is a symbol of the American dream. Uh, this is a picture for uh, Joe Keller. He's playing with Bert and the other boys in the neighborhood, the uh, play of the jail, which is a symbolic uh, jail, which is the psychological jail of guilt Joe Keller is living in. Joe Keller and Kate are living um, a seemingly happy life, but it is not happy because they are keeping a secret. The mother is, uh, we ended our lecture last time with the description of the mother as being, having an, an endless capacity for love and passion and emotions. That's why she's unable to be realistic and to believe the fact that her son is not coming back. The mother is so passionate, she has got uh, this idea of uh, illusion and delusion in order not to put herself into facing reality that Larry is not coming back. We start uh, the rest of our lecture with page 30. Anne appears on stage, uh, sorry, Kate appears on stage and the mother, she talks with her husband and her son. Then on page 30, she tells them no more roses. It's so funny. Everything just hides to happen at the same time. This month is his birthday. His tree blows down. Annie comes. Everything that happened seems to be coming back. I was just down the cellar and what I do, I stumble over his baseball glove. I haven't seen it in a century. The mother here is talking about uh, the fact that uh, she says that everything reminds her of her son uh, that she has lost. Everything attached to him shows up. The tree breaks, Annie, his ex fiance is coming back. She even stumbles over his gloves in the cellar. Uh, the words of uh, Kate, the mother, are so touching. The mother is living with her son. She creates his presence. She does not believe that Larry is not coming back. Page 31, this is at the very beginning. Chris and mommy are talking. So the mom tells him because she Anne is not married. So uh, she's waiting for Larry and she feels that Larry is coming back. At the top of the page on page 31, Chris tells her just because she isn't married doesn't mean she's been mourning Larry. Oh, mom, wake up. Uh, he's in a gradual confrontation with his mother. Uh, it is not a must that because she is not married, so she is mourning Larry and she feels sad and she feels a pity that Larry hasn't come back. Maybe there is other reason that she uh, isn't married so far. At the very end of the page, page 31 and the top of page 32 later, uh, they talk to mother. Uh, Keller tells her, haven't you slept well? Uh, I heard you moving in your bedroom. She tells him that she has been having a dream or rather a nightmare. The mother says, I was fast asleep and raising her arm over the audience. Remember the way he used to fly low past the house when he was in training, when he used to see his face in the cockpit going by? That's where... The clouds are. He was so real. I could reach and crying, crying to me, Mom, Mom, I could hear him like he was in the room. Mom, it was his voice. If I could touch him, I knew I could stop him. If I could only, and she breaks off. So the mother is speaking or uttering so touching words and she's even she brings us to tears she has been all the time dreaming of her son he's going into his airplane and he's waving from his cockpit to his mother when he comes with his airplane down near the house cockpit it means and he waves to his mommy so she recalls these old days but at this time she feels sad she heard her son crying in the nightmare, of course, mom, mom, as if he was uh, trying to find somebody to help him, somebody to rescue him. 
Then the mother utters a very important sentence. If I could touch him, I knew I could stop him. At the beginning, the nightmare or the dream, it's not an, an, a, a mere dream or a simple dream. It's just a nightmare. It is a symbol of Kate's inner desire. She wants to think that Larry is still alive. Yet the crash of the airplane in the dream, or rather the nightmare, is a symbol for her conviction that deep down Larry is dead. Larry is not coming back. The sentence, she says, if I could touch him, I knew I could stop him. This is a very important symbolic sentence. The mother knows a secret. The sentence is a symbol of the unspoken fears of Kate and her denial. Something wrong went and something wrong happened to Larry. The mother knows it, but she keeps it as a secret. So it's an indirect hint. Later on, at the very end of the play, we come to know that Larry committed suicide. So the mother wishes if she had been able to uh, prevent him from doing so. So uh, the sentence here, it's symbolic of the unspoken fears of uh, Kate, the fears that she never utters uh, publicly in front of other people. Then she moves on and narrating her uh, dream. Uh, she says, outstretched hand to fall. I woke up and it was so funny. The wind, it was like the roaring of his engine. I came out here. I must have been still half asleep. He could hear the roaring, which like he was going by. The tree snapped right in front of me and I like came awake. She's looking at the tree. She suddenly realizes something turns with a reprimanding finger, shaking slightly. See, we should never have planted that tree. I said so in the first place. It was too soon to plant a tree for him. The wind here or the storm that breaks the tree uh, in the dream and in reality is a symbol of Larry's death. When the mother says we should never have planted that tree, the mother, uh, the idea is that people plant trees in memory of the dead people. And for Kate, Larry is still alive. It's too early to announce his death. We shouldn't have planted. Okay, it's okay. This tree is broken. Forget about it. It was a mistake right from the beginning to plant this tree because people plant trees in memory of the dead. And my son is not dead. He is still alive. So the mother is living in illusion so far in the play. Towards the middle of the page, this is page 32. This is Chris talking to his mother, the very uh, last three lines of uh, the quote in the middle. Chris tells her, his mother, I've been thinking, you know, maybe we ought to put our minds to forgetting him. Mom, wake up, please. He's trying to gradually confront his mother. It's time to let go. It's time to forget him. It's time to think that he is gone and he's not coming back. The mother tells him that's the third time you've said that this week. Chris says, because it's not right, we never took up our lives again. This is an important quotation for Chris. And this shows his inner conflict. And this shows his dilemma. We never took up our lives again. We have never regained our lives since the missing of Larry. For three years now, we are not living an ordinary, happy life like other people. A very important line and a quotation by Chris. He tells her, we're like at a railroad station waiting for a train that never comes in. This is a highly figurative language, Lugha Magazia, and it is a simile, Tashbih, بيشبه حياتهم من هما في محطة قطر. بنستنين القطر، القطر ده عمره ما بيوصل. So, here he is likening بيشبه their situation and their life and the family's situation to people at a railway station, passengers. Uh, they are waiting for a train to come, but this train never comes, 
never appears. So the train they are waiting for is the appearance of Larry, but Larry never comes. So mother, we have stopped our life at the moment Larry went missing. This is not right. This is not good. This is not reality. We should be realistic mother. We should not be doing all of these things all the time. Page 33. The mother, she doesn't bother with what he says. She mentions several sentences. They are not quotations. They are just sentences that prove her conviction that Larry is coming back. She tells him about Anne. Um, uh, uh, he's not. She's talking to Keller. Mother is talking to Keller about Anne. She tells Keller, her husband, he's not going to marry her. Chris is not going to marry uh, Anne because she's not his fiance. She adds, she's not his girl. And she adds, then why is still she single? She has waited. She knows what I know. The mother is trying by these sentences to self-deceive herself, to self-delude herself. Well, the girl is not Chris's girl. Well, the girl is not going to marry Chris. She is waiting for Larry. She knows what I know. She knows that Larry is still alive and he is coming back. So she is waiting for him. Do not say that she's going to marry Chris because she is not his girl. She is his brother's girl. So the mother is trying to convince people around her that Larry is coming back, but Larry is not coming back. Page 34, she tells him a very important line. This is a quote by the mother at the top of the page. The mother says, warningly, but hazaru, nobody in this house does take her faith away, Joe. Strangers might, but not his father, not his brother. She tells her, fa her her husband in a warning, if all the world believes that Larry is dead and he's not coming back, his brother and his father should never think like that. This is a warning, an alarm about uh, hiding an appalling fact. The mother is hiding something. The mother is hiding a secret that is appalling, mufza wa murab jiddan. If all the people believe he's dead, his father and his brother should never believe that, and they should never she should believe that he is coming back all the time. Keller tells her, What do you want me to do? What do you want? Mother decisively tells him, I want you to act like he's coming back. This is so touching and this is hurting to the feelings. The mother, the word act, the message. This is so touching. So this shows the mother is in perplexed feelings. Deep down, she knows that her son is dead. But she does not want to believe this. She does not want to believe that the indirect reason for her son's death is his father. And she does not want the family to collapse. So she is deceiving herself. Uh, you can say consciously or subconsciously, uh, so the mother tells him, okay, if you don't believe that he is alive, please act as if you believe that he's coming back. Do it for me. Mother tells him, because if he's not coming back, then I kill myself. The mother here is unable to confront reality, is unable to confront the facts that are so harsh for her heart and her feelings. And she even warns, goes on warning Joe Keller when she tells him towards the end of page 34, mother says, you above all have got to believe. In so this is a, hid, a hint to hidden facts. There is something vague, ambiguous, غريبة, related to the relationship between Larry's miss, going missing and Joe Keller. So this is an element of the suspense to all over the play. The gradual revelation of facts. الكشف 
تدريجي للحقائق والحاجات اللي بتحصل اللي احنا مش عارفين حصل ايه زمان so the mother knows and she knows a harsh fact and she's not adapting with it rather she is living in illusion page 35 Bert the boy of the neighbors comes to Joe Keller tells him well let's go to the jail mother decisively tells him there is no jail there is no jail here I want you to stop the jail business because the jail is psychologically the guilt of Joe Keller and physically the jail in which Steve Deaver is imprisoned then in a very important line towards the middle of page 35 uh, mother is warning him not to play the, the the play the game of the jail Keller tells her what have I got to hide يعني أنا هخبي إيه مثلا what the hell is the matter with you Kate مالك أنت مالك في إيه this is so ironic فيها مفارقة he is hiding something he is in reality hiding something uh, so what have I got to hide this is ironic he is playing the game of the jail it is the game of denying guilt so he tells her I don't have anything to hide but deep down he is hiding something and he is hiding a secret and he is denying the guilt Anne appears on page 35. She is described as being Anne is 26, gentle but despite herself, capable of holding fast to what she knows. Chris opens door for her, so she is 26. She has a nice appearance and she seems to be realistic. She adapts with reality quickly. She is not that passionate like Kate. Page 36, uh, it's not that quotation or that crucial idea. It's just that Chris describes Anne as the prettiest girl all over the world. هي أحلى واحدة في الدنيا. And Anne is introduced to Dr. Jim Bayless, who owns the house uh, in which uh, Anne and her family lived before in the past. Page 37, Anne is talking about uh, uh, their memories in the house and how they uh, like to play, the lessons they hated, the algebra they did. Then she mentions an important line when Anne says, gosh, those dear dead days beyond. Gosh, it's the slang word for God. Oh, for God's sake, those dear dead days beyond recall the word that here is not done or it's not mentioned haphazardly at the bottom it is mentioned intentionally and the word here that is a symbol of Larry's death or a hint that Larry died and he is not coming back so not all the symbols are objects even words in the dialogue may be symbolic page 38 Again, this is not uh, a quotation or something like that, but these are situations in which we understand facts about characters. Uh, Anne uh, is taken by mother. She's going to spend the night in Larry's room, but unfortunately, she does not recognize that it's Larry's room. She forgot that it's Larry's room. Mother tells her, no, don't you remember? That's Larry's room. And you mean they are Larry's, all the things and all the items you are talking about? Didn't you recognize them? Even the mother wanted Anne to take the guitar of Larry as a souvenir. But it seems that Anne has forgotten everything uh, attached to Larry. She has forgotten his room, his stuff, and so on. So the mother here um, is astonished and she is shocked because she feels that, Kay, uh, that Anne is still waiting for Larry. But it seems that nobody is waiting for Larry except the mother who does not believe that he is dead. Page 39, towards the bottom of the page, uh, the mother, uh, Kate, and the other uh, characters, including Anne and Joe Keller, they talk of Steve Deaver, the ex-partner of Joe Keller, and Anne, uh, uh, Kate describes him as a decent man. Uh, uh, then Anne tells her delicately, then she tells him, uh, she, uh, Anne is talking to mother well okay I don't care she can take him back if she likes she is talking about uh, her father and her mother and uh, uh, the problems of her father and that he is in prison mother tells him uh, tells her and you um, 
shakes her head negatively go out much and delicately بصورة مهذبة كده بترد عليها you mean am I still waiting for him do you mean Kate you want to ask me a question am I still waiting for your son am I still waiting for Larry to come back Kate tells her yes are you waiting for him and at the very end of page 39 tells Kate well I'm not Kate she's not waiting Uh, for the coming back of Larry or for the coming back of her dad and she doesn't care about all of them she wants to go ahead with her life so she bluntly shocks Kate for she's not waiting for anybody to come back she wants to start her new life again away from everybody in the past page 40 uh, the mother tells her Oh dear, we should wait for Larry. I know that there are some guys who have been missing even longer than Larry and they turned up in Burma. They found him in Burma when who uh, was uh, participating in World War II and he appeared in Burma and they came back. Towards the middle of the page, uh, mother says they don't say it on the radio, but I'm sure in that in the dark of night, they are still waiting for their sons. I'm sure that all the mothers and fathers who have missing sons in the war are still waiting for them. Uh, and she even tells Anne, deep, deep in your heart, of always waiting for him. And she goes, you're going to stay with him, but you're not sure. But Anne resolutely, with a like that, and with a decision like that, she tells her, no, Kate, no, I'm not sure. I'm not waiting for Larry. So Anne, like Chris too, they are the symbol of the future generation. They are the symbol of hope. They want to forget about the past. They want to go on with their lives. They are, Larry is the symbol of the older generation, the symbol of the war, the times of devastation, the times of destruction. While Chris and Anne are the symbols of the newer generations, the generations after World War II, who want to live their life, who want to start fleshly away from the thoughts of the past. Page 41. Uh, Kate, in a very prolonged quotation, this is not yani, a quote to memorize, This she is just narrating things about her uh, missing son, Larry, how she has been waiting for him, and how she thinks that he is still alive, uh, even if there are terrible battles, uh, there are other uh, uh, sons who were missing in the war, and they came back. Page 42. Uh, Frank, their neighbor, enters and he tells her, I'll finish the horoscope tonight. I'll finish the horoscope tonight. It means that he is going to tell her whether November 25th, the day of the missing Larry, was his favorable day or not. And <coughs> tells them, have the neighbors stopped talking about daddy? Chris uh, tells her nobody talks about him. He wants her to come back, so he makes her Uh, feel that everything is okay, you just come back and you will not suffer any problem. So it seems, where is her, her daddy? What's the problem with her daddy? Why are the neighbors talking about her daddy? Page 43, Anne says, the last thing I remember on this block was one word, murderer. Okay, this is an important word. Who are the murderers? Is it her dad only or Joe Keller too? Keller, a very important quotation, page 43. He tells her, tells Annie, don't listen to her, don't listen to Kate. Nobody talks about your daddy and all the people forgot the accident and the crash, Annie. She tells, he tells her, he tells Anne, don't listen to her. Every Saturday night, the whole gang is playing poker in the arbor. All the ones who yelled, murderer, taking my money now. Okay. Keller tells Anne, all oh, the people are hypocrites, dear Annie. Money has got the upper hand. All those who called your dad and myself murderers, they play every Saturday with me poker, a game of poker, and they get my money. They are all hypocrites, my dear Anne, and money talks. They have forgotten everything once they get my money. At the very uh, end of page 43, 
the last uh, um, four lines on page 43, again, this is a quotation by Keller, a prolonged quotation by Keller in which he admits the crash that happened. Uh, he tells Annie again, none of them believed I was innocent. The story was, I pulled a fast one getting myself exonerated. So I get out of my car and I walk down the street, but very slow and with a smile. The beast, I was the beast. Page 44, continuing. The guy who sold cracked cylinder heads to the Army Air Force. The guy who made 21 P-40s crash in Australia. Kid walking down the street that day. I was guilty as hell except I wasn't. And there as a court apron in my pocket to prove I wasn't, and I walked past the porches. Result, 14 months later, I had one of the best shops in the state again, a respected man again, bigger than ever. So here is the revelation of facts, the revelation of the hidden truth, the revelation of the hidden guilt of Joe Keller. He tells her, well, my dear Annie, all the people are ugly. When you talk materialistically or when money talks, all people are ugly. They all knew that I was not innocent. I was responsible indirectly for the crash of 21 P forties, the new tayarat, a واحد وعشرين tayarat راز P forty. It had come of Australia because he was the guy who sold cracked cylinder heads. Bear أسلحة فزنة معيوبة للطيارات بتاعة P40. So the idea is that all people knew that I'm not innocent, but still, I was able because I was so smart to get or to wait. Uh, um, uh, being persecuted, uh, prosecuted at court, and I got after 14 months, I was a very rich man. يعني أنا قدرت إن أنا بطريقة الذكاء وبشطارتي إن أنا أتجنب المحاكمة وما تحطش في السجن وبقيت بعدها ب 14 شهر من أغنى أغنياء المنطقة. So people now look at me as a rich man, as a businessman. They play poker with me. They get my money. They never say again that I'm not innocent. They never again, uh, they never say again, look, he, the, here is Joe Keller, the killer. So this is the ugly materialism. He was so smart to escape prison, masterful at ignoring guilt. There are no morals, just money and interests. And this is the ugly effect of war upon people. They know that Joe Keller is a killer. And they know that he is a criminal. But as long as he is a businessman, he is a rich person, they want to get their interests. And forget about morals. So this is the revelation by Joe Keller that he was the reason for the death of 21 pilots. But ironically enough, he does not feel that this is guilty, but he even praises himself as being very smart and intelligent in evading Uh, uh, the court هو على العكس مش حاسس ان ده ذنب ولا حاجه هو بيتكلم عن شطارته ان هو تجنب المحاكمه والعقوبه. So um, this is very important about Joe Keller. The Keller tells her we are living in an ugly materialistic world. Money has got the upper hand. Money talks as long as you have got money. People will respect you and they will never treat you in a bad manner. So this is the idea of business. This is the idea of money. There are no passions. There are no feelings. There are no morals. So Joe Keller is the complete opposite of both Chris and Kay, the mother. Uh, by this, we have ended our lecture. This is uh, a word uh, script for the most important points that we have discussed uh, in the lecture by page number and quote reference. So these are starting from page 30 till page 44. These are the very, very uh, brief uh, summary of points to the important parts that we covered in this lecture. Thank you very much.